Another story from a hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. James Swan. Hello there. We've been telling you about James Swan, that rightly famous old timer who came to Southwest Washington in 1852 from the gold fields of California, and who wrote his story in a remarkable book published in 1857. We told you yesterday in our scrapbook yarn how Swan came north to visit Charles Russell, a Willapa Harbor oysterman how he became acquainted with the Native Americans, settled on Shoalwater Bay, as Willapo was then known, and began a study of the flora and fauna of the southwest Washington region. We described the incident of a shipwreck on Grace Harbor and the rescue of its crew, and of Joe, the ship's cook, who spent some weeks with Swan cooking East Indian dishes. And tonight, we will tell you more of the experience of James Swan, a true life account of what our part of the West was like in the years before the pioneers had assumed dominance and when the country was still wild and untamable. So when Dick Crombie has said a few words from our sponsor, we'll be back with another chapter of the story of James Swan, pioneer of pioneers and the earliest recorder of life in this place in which we live. Now Dick, some words from our sponsor. James Swan was remarkably suited to the business of pioneering, although he had been raised in civilized New England and had spent most of his productive years as a ship chandler in Boston. A few years he had spent in the gold rush camps of California had taught him to ship for himself, and he had been on Willapa Harbor only a few months before he was accepted as one of the most able of the settlers and an authority on the region. He learned to speak Chinook, acted as a doctor for the Native Americans during the smallpox epidemic and traded with them. He engaged in the oyster business and did most of the Willapa Harbor settlers, shipping the shellfish south to San Francisco on small schooners that dropped anchor in the harbor from time to time. And in connection with his oyster fishing, he desired to purchase from the Native Americans a large canoe. For some time, he had sought a canoe large enough and well enough built for his work, but it was not until a band of Quinault Indians came to his camp one day that he discovered a boat that he wanted. A Quinault chief named Cape, accompanied by his two sons, arrived at Swan's cabin on the shore of Willapa Harbor one day in 1853. They came in a large canoe, which they brought specifically to sell. It was the largest and finest boat of its kind that any of the Native Americans had ever seen, and it arrived paddled by a strong arms of 30 Indians. Having made the trip down the coast from the mouth of the Quinault River, it was 46 feet long and 6 feet in width, and for several weeks the old chief and his tribesmen remained with Swan while they casually negotiated for the boat. Swan described the Quinault chief's sons as the finest looking Native Americans he had ever seen. The eldest was Wamlash, about 22 years of age and perfectly proportioned. The younger, named Y. Yalak, was about 18, and although shorter, was perfectly proportioned and very handsome. They could not understand the Chinook language, which was the universal language of the coastal Indians, so Swan used an interpreter a Quinault named Haït Lith. But who knows, who was known to the settlers as John. He had been in the California gold rush fields and had learned to speak good English while en route on ship and during his days in the gold fields. Though John Swan became a close friend of the Quinaults and it was with the interpreter that he finally negotiated the purchase of the big canoe. The canoe, Swan described as a beautiful example of naval architecture, and in it, he crossed the bar many times at later dates. It was formed of a single cedar log, and he described it as built with the precision and mechanical skill of which any white artisan might have been proud. 
Remember that James Swan knew his boats. He was a ship chandler in his Boston days, besides a keen observer, and his comment on the boats go far to establish the abilities of the native Americans of the Quinault tribe as boat builders. He was later to watch the building of such a boat by the tribesmen. He described the method of construction. A suitable tree was first selected, then chipped all around with stone chisels, producing the effect of a beaver gnawing down a tree. When the tree was felled, it was stripped of its bark, cut to the desired length, and split into two with wedges to provide one section containing two-thirds of the tree. The bows and the stern were then shaped, and the log was then turned over, and the shaping of the boat lines commenced. With no tools other than their eyes, the Indians worked so that when completed, none could see the defects in the sleek lines of the boat. The inside was then hollowed. In these days before the settlers, this was done by fire. When the settlers brought axes, the tribesmen learned to use them skillfully and effectively. When the inside was hollowed, the Native Americans stretched the canoe. This they did by filling the canoe with water, which was heated with stones taken from the fire. At the same time, the fire was built with bark around the outside, and in short, the wood was rendered so supple that it could be spread from six inches to a foot. Stretches were put in to hold it in shape. The headpiece and the stern were put on, and the outside, outside then rubbed down with stones to make the bottom smooth. The outside was painted black with a mixture of burned brush and whale oil and inside coated with red mixture of red ochre and oil. The edges all around were studded with shells and the canoe was ready to be put to sea. Swan watched the building of these canoes and noted in details the methods of construction. And the early Willapos settlers was just as exact when he noted the diet of the, Willa, diet of the Willapa and Grace Harbor Native Americans a century ago. In his studies of the Native Americans, he went into detail to record their habits, their appearance, and their food. One of their delicacies was boiled seal. Cape was very adherent at seal hunting, having taken the white man's rifle and become quite a marksman. When he shot the seal, he immediately stuffed the bullet hole <coughs> with grass or a wooden plug carried for the purpose to prevent bleeding. Then he carried the carcass to his camp where it was signed over where it was signed o signed over a split while the hair was scraped from the skin. The blubber was removed in strips and boiled and the oil skimmed off the water with seashells and placed in pouches or bottles as the Indians called them formed from the animal's stomach. In every Native American Lodge, these bottles of oils could be found, Swan said, and when freshly boiled, resembled lard. It was eaten freely with almost any food, and most of the bottles of oils that the Indians owned determined his wealth and standing in the tribe. Clams were a staple in the Native American diet. They dug gooey ducks, clams, razor clams, the hard shell gooey duck, and quahog were cooked by piling them into, onto hot rocks and covering them with seaweed. When the clams opened from the heat, the water in the shells ran onto the rocks, forming steam, which was confined by the seaweed. The whole pile was soon cooked and usually contained from 10 to 20 bushels of clams, quite deliciously prepared by Swan's cooking reckon, reckoning. To preserve the clams for winter use, the Indians dried them on skewers in the smoke of their fires. Mussels, particularly the white meat mussel, was considered a delicacy. This type of rare, oyster, rare clam in Swan's Day, a hundred years ago, and even more scarce today. Razor clams were baked or boiled by the Native Americans, but Swan was not satisfied with this method and his treatment of the succulent beach clam may be the beginning of what has become one of Grays Harbor and Southwest Washington's favorite dishes. For the pioneer 
Willapa resident rolled them in cornmeal and fried them with slices of salted pork, not too different from our milk and cracker crumb technique in today. And not only did Swan pronounce them delicious, but his friends soon adopted the method. Barnacles were considered a delicacy by the Native American Swan reports. Some of the hard shell parasites grew an enormous size on driftwood and sunken logs and were gathered by the natives for their tables if they can use the smile. The barnacles were available the year round and were one of the staple sources of food during the winter. But with the coming of spring, the Native Americans fared and improved. A wide variety of roots and plants were eaten. The stalks of cow parsnips, we call wild parsnips, and wild celery were eaten raw. Dried salmon eggs were the last of the Indians' wintertime provisions, and the wild growth was eaten with dried eggs as the springtime menu. Leaves of yellow dock were boiled and pulp and eaten with oil. Skunk cabbage roots were boiled and considered a delicacy, and the sprout of the salmon berry, and as it still is by kids today and in our time. One of the choicest of the, wild, of the wilderness vegetables, the sprouts were gathered in bundles and carried to the lodges where the outer skin was removed and the crisp juice center was eaten. The salmon berry shoots came at the season when the herring were running on the Washington coast, and two, and two were considered much as we speak of ham and eggs. The Indians graced his menu with baked fat herring and salmon berry sprouts and thought that surely the world offered nothing better. The berries ripened at the time the salmon were running and were eaten with the fish at the same time during that season. The root of the cattail was eaten raw by the Native Americans and by the early settlers on the Washington coast. It was eaten sliced with sugar and vinegar. Wild strawberries were much sought after by the Indians and abundant along the sand dune areas of the coast. The blueberries, the wild huckleberries, blackberries, gooseberries, and wild black currants were also found in season. And the sala berry was a standard item of the Native Americans' diet. They ate them fresh from the bush or pressed them into cakes containing five or six pounds and put them away in a dry place for winter use, much like a package of raisins. Wild crab apples, wild cranberries, and baked camas root were other staples in the Native American diet in season. Swan, with the natives, learning to relish their food and noting carefully their methods of cooking and preserving their food, for during the long, cold, and damp winters, was a measure of self-preservation to the Native Americans for a hundred years on the Washington coast before any white settlers arrived. As did James Swan, they watched with amazement. And it was to Swan that we are indebted for the accurate record of the Native American ways a century ago and recorded in his remarkable book, Three Years at Shoalwater Bay, written in 1857. Now, Dick Crombie, a few words from our sponsor. Swan tells of the, of the Indians' disregard for other people's property. It was his custom to grind his own pepper as frontier stores often sold the mixture of cornmeal, charcoal, and flour sweepings for this commodity. So Swan brought a whole pepper and ground it in his coffee mill. To clean the mill, he ground a handful of coffee and threw it away afterwards. One day, having just cleaned the coffee mill after grinding pepper, Swan left a cup of ground coffee on the table while he was away from his house. It was borrowed by a Chinook housewife who proper, properly brewed the pot of coffee and shared it with several other friends. Swan describes the natives leaping into the air, fanning their mouths after drinking the mixture of coffee and pepper, and shouting that they had been poisoned. Swan used it as a lesson in property rights, probably one that the Indians never forgot. So much for tonight for James Swan, but tomorrow evening we will again open his remarkable book for a look at Grays Harbor, Willapa Harbor, a century ago, 
through the eyes of a keen-minded man who knew it and who left us some graphic pages for our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Thank <music> you.